What is going on, everybody? My name is Juice from Pizza and People, and as you already know, I love playing retro games, and retro games also include some good spooky ones from the past, so considering Halloween is right around the corner, let's play some spooky games that I like the best. Coming in early on this list is a game called Zombies Ate My Neighbors. This is a game that was made by Konami and LucasArts. It's surprising to see that name affiliated with any game that's not related to Star Wars or Indiana Jones or something of that nature, but it's actually a very, very fun game. Whether you play alone or you play with a friend, this game delivers all the monster madness you'd expect. You are constantly avoiding zombies, killer babies with knives, Jason from Halloween with a chainsaw, and killer fungus, along with a number of other monsters throughout the game. To beat each level, you have to rescue each human on the map. The people range from babies to drunks in a swimming pool. There's an old teacher giving you Fs. That's really nice. I'm only saving your life. I figured you'd give me a passing grade and understand why I didn't do my homework. You also have to save cheerleaders, tourists, dads grilling outside, and others as well. It's a game like Pac-Man or Toe Jam and Earl, where there are 99 levels, at least I believe there are 99 levels, I've never gotten that far, and as the game goes on, it progressively gets harder and harder. Each level may require different weapons and power-ups to get you through it. Though it is a long game, there is a password system, and each password is only four letters long, so it's easy to keep track. I don't know anyone who's ever gotten past the first 20 levels, but if this game isn't enough of a challenge, check out Ghoul Patrol, which is essentially the same game but with slightly better graphics, a story, and a little bit different gameplay. Word of advice though if you're going to pick up either game, always choose Julie, for whatever reason she runs faster. Splatterhouse 3 is a game made by Namco, who by the way is the same company that made Pac-Man. A lot of people seem to like Splatterhouse 2 more than this game, and to be fair I see why. It's simpler and it's just a sweet beat-em-up. But I like Splatterhouse 3 as well, even though I do think 2 is awesome. I'll let the game explain what you're supposed to do. If you wander aimlessly, you will surely fail in your quest. After completing a room, Press the start button to reveal a map of the current floor. Gather the power stones and save them for emergencies. The power of these stones can be released with the A button. Once your flesh will expand with a surge of power. That was the creepiest voice that I could do. I apologize. Hopefully it spooked you guys good. Much like Splatterhouse 2, it is a beat-em-up game, but rather than just being able to go left and right and up and down, it's more of a 3D plane, so you have the option of kind of traveling. You will have to look at the map a lot, and the goal is to get to the X, much like a treasure map or anything like that. I love these little cutscenes. They are pretty ridiculous. And as you go along, you see these little power stones on the ground. Those are the power stones that the game was mentioning earlier with the creepy voice. If you get a bunch of them and you get your power full, you can use that as a, like, a booster and your guy becomes stronger than before, though I really never noticed the difference. It is a game that will get redundant over time, but it's a fun game to bust out every Halloween or whenever you're in a spooky mood. Ghost and Goblins was an arcade game made by Capcom in the early 80s, and was eventually ported to the Nintendo Entertainment System. Much like other games from this era, it was a very simple game. Run from left to right without dying using a certain combination of platforming skills and power-up selection to try and rack up as many points as possible before reaching the end. Sounds easy enough, right? Well, think again. This is one of the most frustrating games you'll ever play. Now don't take that as me saying it's bad, it's incredibly fun and addictive. In fact, it's a game loved so much that it was later remade in 16-bit format with the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis as Super Ghost and Ghouls. Both are essentially the same game, but they have better graphics and different power-ups and different levels to get you through. And really it's actually a little bit more easier than Ghost and Goblins, but still a really fucking hard game. And the cool thing about this 16-bit game is it would later get a spin-off. Similar to games like Mega Man, Capcom's Demon's Crest is a great game for Halloween season. You get to be a devil who flies around shooting fireballs at dragons and other monsters. The thing that I like better about this game is that it doesn't have the arcade style play like Ghost and Goblins where two hits kills you and then it's over. This is a little bit longer, there's a little bit more strategy, and it's a lot more of a 
console friendly game. When the first Castlevania game was released, it really stood out. Most 8-bit games were lighthearted and childish, and in comparison, Castlevania was dark and violent. Looking at it now, it seems just as lighthearted as any other game from that catalog, but during an era where games were like Bubble Bobble and Super Mario, it was easy to see why the game would turn heads. As opposed to it being a game about getting the high score, it was a game where you had to collect power-ups and defeat zombies and ghosts. The combination of dark outdoor scenes to colorful castle rooms hooked gamers who were looking for something out of the norm during the 8-bit era. And as the years went on, even more Castlevania games came out. The immediate sequel to Castlevania, Simon's Quest, was not well received. The graphics were better, the music was sweet, and it had many similar aspects of gameplay that hooked gamers just the title before. However, it was a game with just too much ambition. Whether it's the constant day to night shifts, or all the useless text box, Simon's Quest was a game with too many good ideas not executed the way that it should have been. This was immediately eradicated when Castlevania III Dracula's Curse came out. Nintendo lovers regard it as one of the best games on the console, if not the best. When the NES life cycle was finally coming to an end, it meant that the SNES would have to pick up where the predecessor left off and deliver another awesome Castlevania game. In 1991, the Konami team released Super Castlevania IV on the Super Nintendo. It was a huge improvement on what was already a great game, for starters, unlike all the other Castlevania games, the whip that you used to defeat enemies and find hidden items now could also be used in a 360 degree motion as opposed to just going forward. Your whip was also used to fling yourself from platform to platform on occasion. Super Castlevania 4 was simply a masterpiece. The graphics in each background is very detailed and they set the mood perfectly. Most people thought that this would be the standard for Castlevania games moving forward. However, it would end up being the only game to feature this style of gameplay. Sega would eventually get a Castlevania game as well, and I'd personally argue it's the best game on Sega Genesis. It's not really much different than the other Castlevania games you'd play, except the fact that you have the choice between two players as opposed to just one. The first player that you select still has a whip. But the intriguing part is that you can select another player who uses a lance instead. In 1995, the Super Nintendo would release Castlevania Dracula X, and though there were a lot of people disappointed by it, I think it's the best Castlevania of the 16-bit era. The biggest complaint that it seems to receive is that the whip goes back to only going straight. But to be honest, in Super Castlevania 4, I never actually found many times where I needed to fully control the whip to attack enemies. So I'll take improved graphics, music, and overall gameplay over an overrated feature all day. And if you look at this game, it would foreshadow the future of Castlevania games. Well, the future of a Castlevania game more specifically. Castlevania Dracula X gets picked up on Sony PlayStation's Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Try to say all that a lot, it's pretty fucking hard. The soundtrack is one of the best that I've ever heard, and it really helps guide you through this humongous game. This game features a style of play almost identical to Super Metroid. Even the way you save is exactly the same. The player has to explore the castle from top to bottom, using a map to help guide you to the spots you haven't been to yet. Each area of the map contains items, weapons, and power-ups that you will need to fight the bosses and complete the game. Unlike the other games as well, Symphony of the Night features RPG-like gameplay, where the character, Alucard, will level up and gain experience after beating each enemy. These experience points will make Alucard stronger and give him powers making the game easier. And there you have it, there's a list of some of my favorite Halloween games and spooky games or whatever you want to call it. And I know I left a lot of good ones out, probably like Resident Evil, Silent Hill, but some of those games would have taken just way too long to give you guys gameplay footage of and it would not have done the game justice. And I know some of you are going to think that what I showed you didn't do the game's justices either, but hey, this is just the opportunity for you to go out and play the game and find out how actually sweet they are. So if you didn't like this video, leave a comment below and tell me what you think I should do differently. And if you did like the video, leave a comment below anyway and tell me what's up. Anyways, hit that like button, subscribe, and check back for more videos from Pizza and People.